But we're just talk, start to talk about Beatrix Potter. And uh, her family were very wealthy and they would spend their summers up here renting a big house. And a lot of the characters that she developed throughout the years actually came from people that she knew who actually lived here in Burnham. Um, and her summers really um, established her as a writer and an, as an artist. She was really good at illustrations. And she was also very good at the sciences when she was growing up. She wasn't formally educated at school, but she had three governesses uh, who would teach her at home. Her brother actually went to school and was educated formally. Um, let's we'll move off to the garden gates and hopefully the sound will keep on, will keep with us. But she got, she was very well known uh, locally when she was a child here and she got on very well with a particular man called, he was a postman. And he was a renowned mycologist, so he was really into fungi, mushrooms and the likes. And so was she. And she became famous as a, as well as a writer, she also became famous as a, a botanist. And her, her drawings of various plants, uh, uh, illustrations, filled her books. But also she became very uh, famous at looking microscopically at how fungi uh, reproduced. And so she had a, a very inquisitive mind. And this really set her up for when she was an adult because although she spent her summers here, um, there was one year they could not rent the house and the family then moved, instead of doing vacations in Cumbria. And it's there in Cumbria that she's probably well known. She has her own uh, hilltop farm. And I would highly recommend if you're in a tour of, of Scotland and Northern England to go and visit the hilltop farm, it's still there. She also got interested in preserving breeds, rare breeds of sheep, so the Hedwig sheep um, she was very um, involved in that. She bought lots of land and when she died she gave all of the land over to the National Trust in England and most of the land she gave, gave over actually started to form the National Park in Cumbria. So she was very wealthy, very well known, but it all started here in the little town of Burnham. And I'm going to take you in and show you some of the characters. Okay, I'm just going to say guys, this is where we lost the sound the last time and if we lose it again, we will um, stop and start again and it may be something about the location so if we cannot cover this live we are going to rec do a recorded video of the garden because it's beautiful and we will put that up so uh, stay with us even if our sound goes down because we're going to do our best to to do what we can do for you okay okay and keep on giving us a thumbs up uh, let's see how it goes here. So the Memorial Gardens was established uh, to, with, with money from Be Beatrix Potter Foundation um, because of the link between her holidays here. Uh, throughout the little park, little gardens here, there are some of the characters that uh, she mentions. Now I'll mention, um, we mentioned Peter Rabbit and it's quite appropriate because there's a new film out just recently. It was one of the first films to open when the cinemas opened up and it was a new Peter Rabbit film which is, I think it's doing well in the box office just at the moment. Um, but there's other characters like there's Mrs. Tiddy Winkle, there was uh, Farmer McGregor, and these are all from people that she knew when she was up here as a, as a kid growing up. She loved, her and her brother loved the freedom that they got up here. They were not allowed the freedom in London. And to all intents and purposes, she felt enclosed in when she was in London. But when they were here, they would take out their own pony and traps. They would go around the countryside and they'd meet people. And one of the characters who uh, we all know is Mrs. Tiddywinkle. And Mrs. Tiddywinkle was actually based on a washerwoman at uh, Dalgai's, Dalgie's house. Um, it's just all these influences that she brought to bear. Could I just chip in? Uh, just something here, uh, Joe, because yep. uh, uh, people wonder how these characters originated and you've told us a lot about that but it was this picture letter that she sent to one Noel or Noel Moore a five-year-old uh, boy who was quite badly ill who was the son of his of her governess and she sent a picture letter with an illustration of what was called um, Piper Peter Piper uh, before uh, Peter Rabbit, Rabbit came into being mm -hmm. and that was the origin yeah. of Peter Rabbit yeah yeah and I just want to we'll go around here and we'll try and pick, pick out some of the because there's hidden little characters in this in this garden here. Um, you can see they've got a little um, information station here telling you about the life of Beatrix Potter. Um, she wrote a lot in code. She had developed her own code, like a cipher. 
And it wasn't until the 1960s that the code was actually broken by one character, one guy who was studying the works of Beatrix Potter. And nobody could, un uh, could understand the notes that she had until about the 1960s when the cipher was already broken. But I'll go in here, you will, probably won't be able to pick this up, but in this little part of the garden here we have Mrs. Tiddywinkle in her little hut in here. So it's Mrs. Tiddywinkle the Hedgehog. Again. Let's see in here. There we go. Say hi to Mrs. Tiddywinkle. And it's a pity you can't get the smell because there are some gorgeous smells here as well. Um, we're going to take you into some enchanted forests while we're here and burn them as well. Let's move around a little bit here and you'll get the collection of rabbits. It's nice and sunny, the weather's really good. It's about 18, 19 degrees centigrade here, so Celsius, which I think is about mid 60s Fahrenheit. Yeah, probably about that. But there's still a little cool breeze, which is quite nice as well, isn't mm. there? It's, uh, well, it's, a, it's yeah. the highlands. <laughs> yeah. And we're between sort of mountain ranges, so you get these through drafts coming through. Um, these are the little family of rabbits. This one we had Rainy Zellweger play Beatrix Potter. I think Zellweger was really good actually. Her English accent is perfect. It was Short. good. It was a good movie. Yeah. Miss Potter, I think it was called. Yeah, I think it was yeah. called Miss Potter. Yeah. 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 And again, in Cumbria, um, when you go up to her, the it's the, the town of Hawk's Head is a small village, and Hawk's Head is a beautiful, beautiful village to visit in Cumbria, just across the border from from Scotland. Um, and the land, the, and she was very good at land management. It said that she liked all of the sciences apart from astronomy. But she liked her botany, she liked drawing, she liked, um, she was a polymath in that regard, since she, in terms of um, her interests as well. There's a little one in this little pond here, you might not be able to pick him out, but it's next to the pond is Jeremy Fisher, the toad. I've got a comment from Louise, and she's saying at least it's not Drich. It's not dry. Today. It's nice and sunny. I think May is past us. That was an awful month of May. And it's just in the corner here. You don't know if you can catch them out, just in the reeds there. But there's a little statue of Jeremy Fisher on the other side of the pond. Might and be course, quite difficult to see. In yeah. the, but you might just uh, beyond the He's quite subtle water. sitting there. Yeah. I think it's very well done. I think the way they've done it is, is very good. Just a note that the the potters were uh, very wealthy. Yep. I think they uh, had come from the calico <laughs> trade, certainly Beatrix's mother, and uh, so they were able to come here and stay over an extended time. Mm. And uh, she came in contact with a guy called uh, Sir John Mealy, who was an artist, and I'll be speaking about him later on, but he influenced her uh, beautiful uh, paintings, her beautiful watercolours, illustrations, mm. yeah. I remember this is the time of the, the, the Romantics, the Victorian Romantics would be up here, so we already mentioned um, Shelley, Mary Shelley was come up in, in this area, spent some time in this area as well, she uh, was sent up to Dundee to recuperate for illnesses as well, but she came back up with Percy, her husband, then they went on the t grand tours, a lot of people would do the grand tour of Scotland, um, already um, the trains, the railways were opening the country up and you would have um, Walter Scott writing at the end of the 1700s. He'd already been writing about Scotland and, and the, the romance and, and the, the grandeur of the place. So people were intrigued to come up and see it for themselves and start on their major uh, tours. Let's go out. We're going to take you in because as, as well as Beatrix Potter, um, we've already mentioned that Burnham, Burnham Wood, is mentioned in Macbeth. So another pers person who is, we don't know for sure, but there are records of an English performing troupe um, came up here and performed in Dunkeld and Burnham. And of course Burnham Wood is mentioned in Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 3, where they, through, the witches are foretelling the future and of course Macbeth doesn't believe them and he says, oh, that'll never happen. No, that will never happen you know, until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane. The Dunsinane's about 
15 miles to the east of us here. And of course, we're going to take you into Burnham Woods and we're going to show you a little gem at the very end. So stay with us. We have a little surprise at the end and we hope you're really going to enjoy it. Um, so let's start our walk. Uh, I'll just today's... say something about here, uh, Joe, because yep. uh, there's the Burnham Institute where this part of garden is and uh, it developed in 1880 and it was helped along financially with Beatrix Potter's father, Rupert Potter, who uh, donated a fair amount of money. Uh, you, this is not obviously a newer uh, extension with the, the Beatrix Potter exhibition and so on, but just behind this, the Burnham Institute it was a community centre for uh, education and entertainment. So uh, these people, wealthy people back then, were very much uh, community in, interested in the community pursuits and so on. And philanthropic well. in, yeah, in terms yeah. of the education of the, the, the locals as well, because it also housed one of the first libraries here. We can just let a little picture of the, the fox there. Mike, oh, wow, well. yeah, yeah. So Burnham remembers its people very well. So we've got Beatrix Potter here. You might be able to pick up some of the bird song. Um, you will hear a bit more. Um, and we're going to take you into an enchanted forest, actually into Burnham Wood itself. And maybe we see the witches of Macbeth. Yes, who knows? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it is gorgeous here. I mean, is... you'll see views of the hillsides. Everything's in leaf, so the old it's an ancient forest we're going to go into. Um, and somebody we'll said, uh, Mariana said, they need a statue to be Twix. You know what, that yeah. would be a really good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I don't think there's even a statue of Beatrix Potter down in Hawk's Head um, mm -hmm. in Cumbria. And I've been to Hilltop Farm on numerous occasions. It's one of the tours that I do is down to Hilltop Farm in Hawk's Head. It's near, it's near, it's near this little town called um, Little, there's Little Sorry, S-A-W-R-Y. And then there's a great sorry, and I always make a joke about because you're in England, you're, there's also awfully sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful. It's a beautiful walk, that. A uh, real nice hidden corner in there, yeah. And again, it's off the yeah. beaten track. I mean, a lot yeah. of people will go down to Dunkeld and visit Dunkeld. This is only, what, a mile away from Dunkeld itself? So it's something to add on. And a lovely little cafes here as well, where you can sit outside. Or if it's a rainy day, if it's dry, you can actually go into the pubs as well. So let's cross over the street here, where it's nice and safe. And uh, we'll take you in to... Burnham Wood itself. I'm just uh, going to say something before we move out of uh, Burnham entirely because uh, in the last week in August uh, they oh, have yeah. uh, Highland Games here and they have the World Haggis Eating Championships and uh, at the moment uh, we have one Alistair Ross from Edinburgh who is the world champion haggis eater and he can consume a haggis, an average sized one, in 42 seconds. <laughs> now, he has got a challenger from Newburn Fife, who is uh, Lee Goodfellow, and uh, he is definitely trying to beat him, and he always comes second. The different techniques are, Alistair will drink water uh, while he's consuming the haggis, and uh, Lee will drink beer. So there you go, the world haggis eating championships. So, a thing to look out for. But a haggis is about a pound and a half. That's a, that's a lot of stuff to eat. I mean, I mean, yeah. me. I mean that's, a, that's a lot of awful to eat. So, Mike, what is a haggis? Let's carry on. I just think before we go, I'm just going to talk about yep. uh, mealy. Oh. Okay, Mike here. Here's Mike. I'd just like to tell you about a very famous character uh, from, uh, well, who came here on holiday from London and he was called Sir John Everett Mealy. He was a very uh, well-known painter, very successful and part of what was called the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Now you may wonder, it's quite a mouthful, it was a group of painters and poets and writers who believed that pure art uh, was before Raphael. Now Raphael was an Italian Renaissance painter and they believed that academic art came after Raphael which wasn't as good. They wanted to go back to early Renaissance, very detailed rendering of subject matter, like every flower would be represented and every petal and every blade of grass. And the subject matter tended to be religious and medieval, and they were very interested in Arthurian legend. 
like uh, there was a, a famous painting uh, of um, Ophelia floating down the river in the Tate Gallery and that's one of the ones that's best known but what I'm going to show you is and you can maybe just catch a glimpse of it over the building is uh, this hill I've got a picture by Miele and he came up here he loved Scotland in the autumn especially and he loved it after it had been raining because he said wet pebbles after the rain gave off the most beautiful colours and he was very inspired so uh, later on in the 1870s he was here quite a lot he was doing his fishing he was doing his shooting and um, he was uh, just getting inspired by the Scottish landscape I'm going to show you this one here it's very much more in the pre-Raphaelite a farm here but you can see we've got uh, the hill here beside Burnham and he lived in Erigmore house he stayed there he let the house and uh, it, it enabled them to be very inspired so you see all the kind of wood being taken away for burning and the figure here as well so that that is more a sort of pre-Raphaelite type of uh, subject matter where it's got figures in it but I'm going to show you another painting. And we're just seeing the top of the hill over the top of the buildings here. Yeah. Um, you'll see the crest of the hill. It's exactly just there. Yeah. That hill just behind. You can't see it too well from here, but that it was. He just loved the subject matter here. Now I'm going to put that one away, and I'm going to show you another one, uh, which is a very well-known uh, picture, in fact. And. Many people have got this on the wall and they don't know who it's painted by. It's just such a beautiful picture and it's called Chill October. And it was painted in 1870 by uh, Sir John and he painted it on the spot. Uh, so this was uh, painted at Kinfons in Persia, very much in the open air. And would you believe it, Vincent van Gogh saw this picture and admired it hugely. It, it, it is just so iconic. So he was here, he uh, loved the area. There was lots of people of the 19th century, big names, including Felix Mendelssohn, including uh, Turner, the painter as well, including the Wordsworths as well, the poets. So this whole beautiful landscape in Persia was very inspirational to artists, musicians, poets, writers, you name it, and of course, Beatrix Potter. I've so, got a question of, is it, is, it, is it oil or watercolor? Uh, these are both oil, oil. They're, they're, they're painted in oils, but uh, chill October, and this is the River Tay, and last week Joe was talking about the River Tay, which is the longest river in Scotland, which is over 120 miles long, and in its fastest flowing areas, it's really fast, and it's a salmon river it's as a well. It's salmon river. Yeah. So, Miele, look out for that, his name, M-I-L-L-A-I-S. Because a lot of people think he's French, but he's actually English. He's English, yeah. So you maybe want to have a look at the machine here while we're having a pause. This reminds me of a song. I am a linesman of the county. There he goes. He's been painting the white lines. So he's a linesman. It, it's amazing how things can change, Joe, isn't it? It's just like... <laughs> <laughs> Say again? I don't think they want me. You're famous. You've got, <laughs> You're famous you've got now. people watching all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> Explain the haggis, Michael. Well, the haggis is. And is, it, is it haggis season yet? Uh, <laughs> not quite. It's usually haggis season in January. Mind yeah. yourself as a taxi. It's the difference between the highland haggis and the lowland haggis, isn't oh, it? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, you've got to watch. They can be quite uh, fast on their feet. Yeah. And they just love hiding in the heather, and you've got to go out there with your gun in the haggis season, which is January, to get one for your burn supper to celebrate the birth. Yeah. of Robbie Burns. And you can use their pelts to make bagpipes. You can as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, yes, but, I, love, and it's a big I but. do eat haggis. Uh, Mike eats haggis. We all eat haggis. Um, but traditionally, we'll eat it um, on Burns night. Uh, Burns did his poem, Ode to a Haggis. And I do like it. I do like haggis. It's nice and peppery. Um, you can get it made with mutton. You can get it made with um, venison. You can have a vegetarian haggis. You can get kosher haggis as well. Um, I think I told you before, I, I had a friend when I was at university, um, was Jewish and we used to go to um, the Jewish societies 
Burns night, but they called it Rabbi Burns as opposed to Rabbi Burns. <laughs> and they had kosher haggis. Um, so you can get all types of haggis or haggai. Yeah. Um, and it is delicious and it's well eaten. And I would highly recommend it. People see it. There's a thing in, when I was in uh, the States, I was living, it was near Pennsylvania, and they had this thing called Scrapple. And it's yeah. very similar to it. Um, and I always say to people, listen, if you've eaten a hot dog, you've eaten a hell of a lot worse than a haggis. <laughs> at least you know what's going into a haggis. You have no idea what goes into a hot dog yeah. at all. So. It's mutton. It's mutton. But it's the bits of the sheep that most people would throw away. Yeah. Which is the awful. The lights. Yeah. Uh, but it's very tasty if you season it nicely mm -hmm. and it's mixed up with oatmeal as well. Yeah. So I like haggis and you would take it with um, potatoes and neeps. And yeah, now if you so have a look, that, that is the that's, picture that Mele, that's the picture. You can see, see the hill. If you can get it. Here it is. If you look at the painting, now you see that distinctive bit here, and if you look over in the distance, you will see that distinctive bit. You see that it's a bit more uh, trees there now, oh. because remember this was painted back in the 1860s, so there's been a lot of growth of trees in the time in between. Well, there's also been a policy, policy of reforestation as well. Reforestation. Yeah. So it's quite, I find it amazing to look back at old paintings and get to the location. And we're walking in the footsteps of giants, of, basically. We are, absolutely are. He was a huge inspiration, but you know, there was a backstory. Uh, he knew John Ruskin, and uh, he knew John Ruskin's wife probably too well. I think a lot of people knew John Ruskin's wife very well. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a movie called <laughs> Effie Gray. Effie Gray, yeah, look at this and, lovely... And uh, uh, it London. was a case of uh, Miele uh, having an affair with John Ruskin's wife and eventually she left uh, Ruskin and uh, married Miele. Now you know she was what's a unbelievable about. about this. Queen Victoria, of course loved Mele, loved his paintings and everything. But when that happened, she would not invite Effie Gray to dinner parties or functions because she was the bad one. She Mele was a woman was of perfect perfect morals. Because he was a man. Yeah, of course. So there you go. <laughs> Queen Victoria, and she was a woman, but uh, she didn't want women to go into medicine either. She believed that things should be male dominated. Yeah. But there you go. That was the Victorians. So yeah. just listen here now. We're actually in Burnham Wood. And can you hear the bird song? Gorgeous. It is beautiful. I hope yeah. we've still got you folks. Uh, no, it, somebody say, is it sacrilegious to have some HP sauce on your haggis? You can have a haggis in any which way you choose. I actually like it with lots of gravy. Well, I'm my, son, find it a bit dry. my son loves it with uh, tomato ketchup. Yeah, I've had it with chilli sauce as well, which yeah. is nice as well. So I would take haggis. And of course in Scotland you can go to a fish and chip shop and you can get deep fried haggis. Deep fried haggis, yep. yeah. And you get white pudding as well. You get white pudding, black pudding, mealy pudding. Red pudding. Red pudding and fife. As well, yeah. I know. So we don't just eat deep fried Mars bars, but we'll have them as well. <laughs> Anything in Scotland <laughs> can be deep fried. <laughs> <laughs> hence the physique, hence yeah, like uh, deep fried, A deep fried haggis is like a heart attack on a plate. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the forest here, and we talked about um, walking in the footsteps of giants. Yes. Well, we're yes. going to show you some of the giants here. And of course, we did mention Burnham Wood, and we did mention the witches. Well, we're going to show you a little surprise here, which date back, dates back to the Shakespearean period. So we're talking about 1600s? Yeah. I just wish we had this in Odorama because the smells of the forest are gorgeous as well. You're getting all the fresh smells. And we're, all, we're actually in the banks of the River Tay. So it's uh, somebody says here, I'd rather have a Scotch pie. Yeah, I like a good Scotch pie too. Scotch pies are <laughs> and good. And a Bridie. A Bridie. Don't forget far, the Bridies. Far, far for Bridies. Bridies yeah. yeah. And if anybody doesn't know what a far for Bridie is, yeah. it's a uh, pastry and it's in a sort of crest. How would you describe it? It's like, it's like a, a half foot. circle. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like a Scottish, what do you call that, Italian pizza that's folded over? Oh, I'm not sure what that I'm is. I'm sure somebody will come up with it. <laughs> somebody will know. But calzone, a calzone. calzone. It's like a Scottish calzone. Yeah. And you get an ingin and an o. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting very Scottish now. I'm getting very Scottish. I'll have two bridies and an ingin and an o. 
and an onion one as well. So, so here we are. Look These at this. are the land of the giants here. This is just unbelievable, you know, and uh, we've got this big, this is big tree country. Yeah. Because yeah, sure uh, as Joe country. said last week, uh, the, Earl, the Dukes of Athol uh, wanted to entertain their guests and have nice walks when they came to visit them and uh, they planted trees, but this, these trees here are natural. They're not, they weren't planted, they were just here. And uh, it's not me. It's not me, I'm, I'm a sycamore. A sycamore. Let's go on. So we'll oh, there's on. a lovely wee dog there. <laughs> so we got the sunshine coming through. The dappled sunshine the branches, coming through the forest. Which is one of my favorite effects, mm. you know, especially as a painter. We come down here quite a lot and do a bit of watercolour. So somebody just said, wow, look at that tree. Well, wait till you see what's wait coming. Wait till you see what we've got in <laughs> store. It's so, not me either. Keep on going. Not me either. But these are pretty awesome. Yeah, and they built a hydroelectric um, station just further up river in the town of Pitlochry and because this is such an important fishing river they actually have built uh, what they call a salmon ladder and that allows the salmon to get back up to where to spawn so they go back to their birth areas the salmon always return to the place they were mm -hmm. born in yeah, yeah. to actually spawn in so this is the tree we wanted to show you this is it this is the Burnham oak this is the Burnham oak yeah and this dates back to the 1600s and quite possibly could be before that yeah yeah 600 years old it says isn't it well they say that shakespeare uh, came here in about uh, the 1580s and the 1580s and burnham wood was here and this is part of burnham wood Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burnham would to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. As we said, we've got no records of Shakespeare actually being here by himself, but there are records of an English performing troupe mm -hmm. being in this area. So we can be a little bit cavalier with the history and say we're walking in Shakespeare's Yes, music. and, it's and we were, Mike and I were talking that we, we never really associate Shakespeare with Mary Queen of Scots, but Mary Queen of Scots would have been in captivity during Shakespeare's period. Yes, because he yes. wrote Macbeth for James. Yes, he tried to ingratiate himself with the new Stuart king, um, but he was also known as the Elizabethan writer. But then, when That's this right. upstart came from Scotland, moved his entourage down, Shakespeare wanted to ingratiate himself with the new king, with the Stuarts, and so hence we get Macbeth. And the connections but, with uh, Glam's as well, yeah, and that Dane. was all for the consumption of James the Sixth of Scotland. It's a glorification yeah, of the Stuarts and the Scottish history. We'll take you right down to this tree here. It's got supports on it to keep it up because it is so old. The tree is uh, suffering because it's so old and uh, there was flooding here and it was uh, a lot of it was submerged in water. In fact, you can see the lichen here. This would have been probably the watermark would probably be up about that level there. Now, it is needing tender, loving care, but to get that you need money and there is a funding uh, initiative in place to get some tree surgeons to come here and to uh, do a bit of knowledgeable cutting to preserve the tree. And also, you see these supports, the supports that are holding up these huge, massive, heavy branches, they are going to need replaced as well. So it's a work in progress. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're just going here and it is a gorgeous tree. So Mar Marjorie Hutchinson says it's a gorgeous tree. And then Mike's going to show us. I don't, don't know if we're going to get any light in there. But no, you can uh, just go in all the same. I'll, I can I'll, see. I'll give you a bit of scale <laughs> yeah. in terms of this. And uh, there you go. If we can get in, which I probably can't. There we go. Ooh, right. And so. you can stand up. You can. Yeah. There we go. There you go. Probably a nice little den for an old fox or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's quite warm in here. Yeah. There we go. So we're going to finish off quite shortly. So we've shown you Burnham Oak. So you must come, if you're coming up to this part of the country, you must come and see the Burnham Oak. 
Um, I mean, there are huge trees all around here. Uh, it's a great walking place. It's great for, for, you can hire bikes, you can cycle around here. It's a great place, but I love this peekaboo, says Louise. <laughs> the wee so, pathway, I mean, it's just beautiful. They're seeing the way the sun is coming through. Mm. Not surprising that Melee loved it, but you know, he preferred it in the autumn. Uh, there was something about the colours he believed were, which they are, with the turning leaf, mm. very inspiring. But very inspiring at any time of year. And of course we're coming down to the River Tay now. This is the River Tay. We're on a little river beach. Of course it's not getting dark here now until about 10.30, 11 o'clock. Probably about then. Yeah, well, yeah. I, was in, I was up in Pitlochry on Friday and we were in the restaurant and it was light until about 10.30. Yeah. So yeah. we're getting near the longest day here. The further north you go. And there's another view of that uh, hill we were talking about earlier, the Mealy Hill. And if you look further down, you will see a scattering of buildings. And the Tay Bank Hotel is down there, which was, used to be owned by Doogie McLean, who wrote Caledonia. And I think uh, we spoke we about that. We mentioned Caledonia before. And that earlier too. Yeah. yeah. So. So I'll just do a little panoramic around here. Um, you can see some of the rhododendrons across the other side of the river. And the river is so tranquil at the moment, it's just so, so, so inviting. And it flows all the way down to, the, to, the, to Dundee and then into the sea eventually. Yeah. The colours So the just... two cities are on the River Tay, that's uh, Perth, awesome. Perth and Dundee. Mm -hmm. And we are promising to take you to Dundee as well. Yeah. Dundee is one of the new, it's, uh, is it the fastest growing city in Scotland at the moment? I think it is. Yeah. It's a very cool city. Yeah. Uh, Culturally, it's very, very cool. Yeah. So, so we'll we're going you. to finish it off here, shall we?